Super. Okay, now I invite our next speaker, Miss um, Laura Miles. Uh, she will be speaking on the tackling the microplastics problem by TDGSMS, TDGCMS, a case study. Laura, she is a senior application scientist at Marques International, UK, based in UK. Okay, let's. Uh, okay, yeah. just okay. My Can you open? Yeah, please open your screen. Okay. Super. Uh, let me quickly introduce about you. Um, she is a, as I mentioned, she is a senior application specialist at the Marque uh, in the thermal desorption business unit. She is responsible for the developing a new methods and testing, and particularly in terms of the thermal desorbers for new and emerging applications. She joined the Marques in uh, as a customer support specialist in 2014 before she moving to the uh, application development department. As part of her current role, uh, she works closely with the key opinion leaders in collaboration across a variety of market areas. And she has a particular specialization in environment analysis, rhythmics, and defense and forcenics. Lara, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the introduction. So today I'm going to be sharing a case study looking at the analysis of microplastics using thermal desorption, um, or TD, with GCMS. So I will get started. So what is thermal desorption? So TD is a sample introduction technique for GC and GCMS. It enables the analysis of trace level volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds, so VOCs or SVOCs, from a wide range of samples covering numerous application areas using extraction and pre-concentration techniques. So these samples could be anything from food and fragrance to materials and environmental. So there's a few examples shown there at the bottom of the slide. The most common sampling method uses a sorbent tube where a volume of air can be taken onto the sorbents inside, trapping the compounds of interest. Uh, alternatively, samples can be taken via canisters or directly onto the focusing trap for online samples. In addition to this, direct desorption can be performed where a small amount of sample is placed directly into an empty tube and heated to release the VOCs uh, directly into the system. Uh, so this is the ideal technique for the analysis of microplastics. This process enables analysis of polymers for the identification of marker compounds to characterize and quantify microplastics to help determine not only their source, but also their journey throughout the environment. So how does this actually work? So in stage one, the tube is loaded into the system and dissolved in a reverse flow of carrier gas, which is what we call back flushing. The dissolved analytes are then transferred in the flow of carrier gas from the tube and onto the focusing trap. During this stage, an optional split can be used for high concentration samples to reduce the concentration being introduced into the system. So this optional split is recommended when performing direct desorption. During the second stage, the focusing trap is then rapidly heated with a rate of up to 100 degrees per second in a reverse flow of carrier gas, again, backflush operation. This enables the analytes to be transferred to the GC column as fast as possible for the sharpest chromatographic peaks. A split flow can also be used here for any high concentration samples, and this also enables the reconnection of samples onto sorbent tubes, so you can archive these for future reanalysis. So why would you connect a thermal desorption instrument to a GCMS? So firstly, we have sensitivity. So the inherent pre-concentration of thermal desorption means reaching new detection limits of trace level analytes is much easier. The versatile sampling options, as well as minimized sample preparation process, also provides benefits by enabling a wider range of samples to be analyzed with reduced manual handling and um, all requirements for additional solvents, saving you both time and money. The high automation of a TDG CMS system, especially with the easy overlap mode, provides enhanced productivity, where the next sample can be loaded and dissolved while the GCMS is still running the previous sample. So this means you can get the most out of your system. TDGCMS can also be used for the identification and confirmation of analytes, which is particularly useful for unknown samples. And this enables discovery of more compounds by spectral matching with established libraries. Lastly, the Marx TD systems are platform neutral, which means they can be added to any brand of GCMS, 
including existing systems, which means they are lower capital investment overheads. So what can this offer the analysis of microplastics? So there are a number of features for this TDG CMS system that can provide a wide range of benefits in this application area. So simple sample preparation steps mean the process can be applied to a wide range of sample types. This saves users time and money and provides confidence as manual handling steps are minimized. The technique is also applicable to a wide range of particle sizes as it is only limited by the type of filter chosen. So the analysis of nanoplastics as well as microplastics is possible. Larger sample sizes mean more representative samples can be taken, meaning higher sensitivity and better repeatability, all leading to lower cost per sample as well as high data quality. Quantitative results can be obtained easily with automated workflows while simultaneously providing more information about the sample, enabling the lab to deliver more than just the amount of one specific plastic. Finally, TDG CMS is well established in materials testing and polymer characterization and included in a wide range of regulated methods. The inbuilt features such as leak tests, diffusion locking, internal standard and so on combine to give any microplastics analyst confidence whether they are working on high end discovery applications or high throughput routine analysis. But where do microplastics come from and why should we care about them? Well, long-term effects of microplastics on human health are still unknown, but research suggests there could be some impact to our endocrine systems affecting our hormones, which regulate numerous processes within the body. Recent research into microplastics showed top contributors to human consumption are largely related to packaged foods and drinks, including bottled drinks, tap water, seafood, sugar, salt, and honey, as shown in this infographic. Looking more closely at the standard American diet, in 2019, Cox found that per litre of sample, bottled drinks and most specifically bottled water provided the largest source of microplastics, which poses the question of how much of this plastic packaging is getting into the liquids inside. This brings me to our application at 150, where our collaborators at Eurofinterproma demonstrated the use of thermal desorption for the analysis of polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, in bottled beverages, due to concerns it was migrating from the packaging and into the drink. Firstly, the marker compound for PET was identified by analysing standard pellets by direct thermal desorption. 2,4-ditopbutalphenol was used for quantitation, and tetrahydrofuran was used for confirmation. QC checks confirmed the blank showed a zero result for a plastic-free filtration and analysis process, and a spiked sample showed greater than 90% recovery. Using the marker compound, linearity results were calculated, and results found to produce an excellent R-squared value of 0.9984. Filtrates from a variety of bottled drinks were verified to contain microplastics by examination under a microscope, and then analysed by TDGCMS for confirmation. PET marker compounds were found and the concentration of a bottled water sample determined against the calibration to be 46 micrograms per litre, providing a value for comparison to others in future. So what else can we analyse with TDG CMS? As we saw in the previous slide, salt is a contributor to human consumption of microplastics. Microplastics are present here due to several human activities, such as industrial process, inadequate disposal and runoff from land. As water evaporates, the microplastics can become trapped in the sodium chloride crystals as they dry, and so are present when salt is harvested. So there are three different types of salt to consider. First, we have table salt, and this is the most commonly purchased salt used for the food, uh, for the food industry and in cooking and preservation, as well as in agriculture and industry. It is highly processed to create the uniform white granules we're all familiar with, and often fortified with additional minerals, so may contain some microplastics from source or from the processing treatment it has undergone. Sea salt is a very common option for consumption and is often harvested by hand. The extraction method often follows old traditional techniques where salt pans are used to evaporate seawater, 
leaving the salt crystals and any microplastics from plastic pollution behind. Lastly then we have rock salt, which is obtained from salt mines. These deposits are a result of an underground sea evaporation that took place many years ago inside caverns and likely to have been disturbed by humans during formation. In theory, therefore, rock salt should have a lower amount of microplastics in comparison to other options. Knowing what levels of the microplastics are in these different types of salt can help to determine how much of an impact these microplastics could have on humans. But before we can dive in and analyse some salt samples, we need to identify marker compounds for more polymers. The same process for marker discovery was performed in this application as well, where four polymer standards were analysed by Eurofinsoproma using direct TDGCMS and the chromatograms analysed for significant marker compounds. So as you can see, the resultant chromatograms are quite clean and show a few distinctive and unique peaks that can be used for markers. Polystyrene powder, seen at the top here, produced the profile um, here with the largest peak identified as the monomer styrene, which is sub subsequently chosen as a marker compound by Eurofinsoproma. Nylon 6 produced the bottom chromatogram and the largest peak highlighted here was identified as caprolactam, which is the unique monomer for nylon 6. Again, for polyethylene terephthalate, Eurofinsoproma determined 2,4-dito-butylphenol as a marker compound, the same as with application note 150. And lastly, with PVC, benzene was identified as the marker compound, where the polymer breaks down and reforms the stable aromatic structure during analysis. After this marker identification process, further testing was performed to determine if these compounds were linear and could be used for quantitative results. Calibrations of each polymer were performed by weighing increasing masses into sample tubes with a range of 0.1 to 1.2 milligrams. Using the marker compounds identified in the previous slides, you can see the results in these linearity plots where all compounds show an R squared value of greater than 0.993, proving the marker compounds are linear and can be used for quantitative analysis and concentrations of microplastics can be determined from real samples. So how is this applicable to salt? The sample preparation process is similar to that used in our published application note of bottled drinks. A salt sample is weighed out and placed on top of the quartz filter, seen in the image at the centre of the slide. The filter is then washed with a few litres of ultra pure water to dissolve the salt, collecting the residue on the filter. This is then washed in exactly the same process as described previously. So this uses hydrogen peroxide, acetone and methanol to remove external contaminants before taking the filter out and drying for two hours at 100 degrees in a glass dish. The filter is then placed inside an empty thermal desorption tube and analysed within the TDGCMS system using direct desorption at 320 degrees. This sample preparation process is straightforward to implement, typically takes less than an hour and can be applied to filters used for a wide range of sample types, so it's a fast and straightforward workflow. So let's have a look at the results. Here you can see the profiles from samples of a Celtic sea salt, a Himalayan rock salt, and a commercial brand of table salt. As might be expected, the Celtic sea salt sample shows a much busier profile with a number of peaks present at higher concentrations. This is expected due to the increasing amount of pollution seen in oceans and specifically high traffic areas like the Celtic Sea, which therefore make their way into salts from this area. The Himalayan rock salt displays a cleaner profile, with fewer peaks observed and at lower concentrations relative to the sea salt. This is to be expected given this product is sourced from a much less visited part of the world with reduced contacts from humans and industry. The branded table salt exhibited the fewest peaks and at the lowest concentrations, suggesting the processes used in the production of this table salt clean up much of the external sources of contamination. But were microplastics identified and quantified in these salt samples? So here I have a table to show you the results of this study for these four specific polymers. A lab grade sodium chloride sample was used as a blank and confirmed to contain none of the marker compounds and therefore no microplastics, confirming the sample preparation and analytical process is free from microplastics cont contamination. 
Two spike QC samples were analysed, consisting of a mix of three polymers for polymer identification, and a sodium chloride sample spiked with a known quantity of 0.3 milligrams of nylon-6 to confirm the presence of the marker and to verify full recovery, which as you can see here was confirmed to be 0.329 milligrams. This demonstrates the key benefits of using TDG-CMS, where not only can polymers be identified using marker compounds, they can be quantified as well, so this enables comparison to other analyses in future investigations. For the salt samples themselves, the results showed the presence of some marker compounds, meaning microplastics were identified. The Himalayan rock salt shows a low response for PVC and polystyrene, but a comparatively higher result for PET. As it's unlikely the Himalayas have much contamination of PET, this may be due to the packaging the salt was stored in for sale. Caltic sea salt otherwise displayed the highest results for both PVC and polystyrene, although the presence of nylon-6 was not recorded in any of the samples. With larger projects and sampling protocols in place, this information could be really vital to build a map of microplastics presence across the world and enable the results to relate to existing government analysis guidelines of pollutants in the environment for current and future regulations. So to summarise these case studies I have shown, confident identification of microplastics using evolved VOC markers by TDG-CMS, quantitative correlation between the mass of polymer and the peak area response of the marker compound. So TDG-CMS can provide a mass balance concentration, for example, in micrograms per litre. The whole process is free from plastic contamination, eliminating the risk of false positives. We have great recovery results for the entire process from multiple sample types. The lower uh, temperature desorption gives sufficient information to identify and quantify the plastic and also simultaneously provides you the opportunity to um, determine additional information such as additives and contaminants to aid source profiling and toxicity evaluation. The workflow is straightforward and fast, taking as little as one hour per sample for preparation and 30 minutes for analysis. So simply transferring the entire filter to the TD tube for analysis not only increases sensitivity but eliminates any concerns over inhomogeneity of the filtrate and saves time and reduces the risk of error with manual handling. And finally, TDG-CMS is a well-established and well-understood technology. Data processing is simple and easily automated, enabling you to obtain the most out of your investigation. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, Lara. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Uh, we have Thank quite you. a few questions here. Um, let me take a few questions here. Okay. Um, what was the TD condition used for the your analysis, for these analysis? Yeah. Okay, so the um, conditions uh, have been published already in our application at 150, which I believe if you want a copy, you can obtain from our booth. The um, thermal desorption temperature is 320 degrees for the sample tube. Um, and then we use quite high splits um, to ensure um, no overloading of the system. <laughs> And there is one more question here. As we learned from previous presentation, PS monomer is un very unspecific and benzene is a very common compound, unspecific. How can you be sure about microplastic origin? Okay, so um, I did show a couple of um, additional analyses where we ran the um, blanks through the system and showed that there were no um, uh, peaks um, identified for both the benzene and styrene um, compounds that you mentioned. So we know that the system is free from any of those compounds and also the sample preparation process. And we also, as part of the um, sample preparation process, have a number of uh, solvents and um, washes, which um, aim to break down any um, matrix effects, um, leaving only the microplastics behind. Uh, which was confirmed by Eurofins Aproma by um, comparing the results um, under microscope as well and verifying that only microplastic presence were um, microplastic particles, sorry, were present on on the filter before analysis. Okay. Well, there is one more question here: is so what is the source of PET in bottled water? Because if we look at the properties of conventional polymers, it takes a long time for a breakdown. Sorry, could you repeat that? There's a, so, so they're asking to explain what is the uh, source of PET in bottled water? Because if we 
it 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 took it like the, the property if you look at the properties of the conventional polymers it takes a very long time for a breakdown Okay, so I think it, it's been suggested that the source of PET in bottled water is from the bottle itself. Um, obviously, there are a number of different um, considerations here, you know, whether how long the, the liquids have been stored in the water for, yeah. what temperature they've been stored at, whether it's been stored in any presence of sunlight, because I, I believe that has some effect. So there's quite a few different things there that, that can um, that can have, you know, environmental impact on, on, on the results that you're getting. But it is suggested that it's the bottle itself. Okay. Thanks, Lara. I appreciate it. Well, uh, excellent presentation. Okay, guys, if you keep in touch with Lara and she'll be at the booth as well, right? Yes, yeah, I will be. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we can pick her brains in the next three, two days.